So uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Ian Moss, who will talk about the false vacuum decay in ultra cold spin one Bose gas. Please go ahead, Ian. Uh, thanks, Lucky. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about work I've been doing with Tom Billam and Kate Brown at Newcastle. Um, Tom can't be with us, unfortunately, today, but Kate's here. Uh, Kate's done all of the numerics of this project, and if you have a question about the numerics, she's, she's kindly volunteered to answer it. Uh, so let's, let's start sharing the screen. Hopefully that works. Um, can everybody see that? Yes. Silence signifies consent, I assume. Uh, so this is about, um, this is what we wrote up in a face paper recently. We put in physical review A letters, not physics rev letters. Uh, actually, that's a mistake on the um, reporting that we need to correct. Um, I'll give a, 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 just a little overview about bubbles in general, um, in case there anybody here is not connected with a sort of false vacuum decay package of the consortium. Um, briefly, I'll mention vacuum decay in a two-stage atomic system. Uh, focusing mostly on vacuum decay in a three-state atomic system. Um, I think it, it's useful to define a first-order phase transition as one that takes place through the nucleation of bubbles. It sort of shortcuts a lot of intermediate stuff. So the rough idea is you have some system that cools into a metastable state and escapes from the metastable state to the formation of bubbles. And this is a situation that's similar to everybody who's boiled a pan of water uh, because the water steam transition is of this type. You can boil water, you can supercool steam and supercool steam will form little droplets of moisture at one point. Um, you could take a, a supersaturated gas of carbon dioxide in liquid. And here again, the gas would come out in the form of bubbles as shown in the middle here in this experiment. Um, containing a glass of champagne. Uh, I find the kind of interesting application of bubble nucleation recently. Um, there are two types of volcanic flows, um, the so-called lava flows and pyroclastic flows. Uh, the pyroclastic one is, is a sort of a, a very dangerous one that leads to loss of life and much destruction. And the difference between the two has to do with the fact that the lava can boil. And, and the, the theory of pyroclastic flows can start from this idea of little bubbles forming in, in the lava. And the basic theory is similar to the sort of Landau theory that I'm going to describe on the next slide. So um, the two um, foundations of the theory of bubble nucleation, uh, both due to Landau, one is Gisbert-Landau theory. The idea here is, is that you have a system with two different phases and you have some kind of effective field which has different values in the two phases. And, then, and this field has an effective potential. In the favored phase, uh, the effective potential uh, is minimized by some value of the field. And in the metastable phase, the, effect, the, the potential has a local minimum at that value of the field. Um, throughout this talk, I'm gonna use a common notation where the potential barrier is going to be labeled, is going to be parameterized by some parameter lambda. And the difference in energy between the true, between the true, the, 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 the true minimum of the potential and the local minimum is going to be labeled by this parameter epsilon. Um, the next theory is Landau's theory of bubbles, uh, extended to quantum field theory by Langer and, and Coleman. And in this theory, the idea is that. Uh, a fluctuation in, 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 in the system can lead to a bubble, like the blue one here. And once this bubble is nucleated, it grows. But the probability of nucleation is related to uh, a solution to the equations of motion in imaginary time called an instanton. And we have a decay rate, which is given by a complicated formula on the slide. Um, there's quite a messy prefactor, and there's an exponential. The exponential is the most important term, exponential of minus the Euclidean action of this instanton solution. Um, all of the uh, other stuff in front is a quite a complicated factor. Um, there's no need to actually um, remember this formula. I'm going to come to it later though. Uh, by the way, I produced an app <laughs> that just, just put nucleates bubbles at random. 
And, and if someone sponsored me to join the Apple Developer Project, I could actually make it uh, more widely available, uh, pictures from the app there. Um, the focus, I think, of our work in this consortium is to try and understand bubbles in the early universe, ultimately. Um, but to be honest, um, most of the standard model phase transitions that would have taken place in the early universe would have been second order. Um, however, the consequences of having first order phase transition are so exciting that it's worth um, modifying the standard model a little bit and get a first order transition. And that can lead to all sorts of exciting things. For example, the electroweak transition um, occurring about 160 GeV. Um, if that's a first order transition, then the bubbles form may lead to formation of gravitational waves detectable uh, by the LISA observatory. Um, and would uh, also be an interesting source of baronet symmetry in the universe. Inflation is, well, cut the, uh, the standard uh, slow roll inflation is a second order transition, but you can bolt on first order transitions during inflation. Um, in fact, the very first paper I worked on, uh, gosh, too long <laughs> when I was a PhD student, was on colliding bubbles uh, in inflation to form uh, black holes. Um, you could also have uh, bubbles forming CMB distortions, which is something that uh, people in this consortium have, have analyzed. Um, there's also a possibility um, that uh, the Higgs could decay um, catastrophically during inflation. Uh, that's something I've worked on with, with Ruth Gregory. So um, if you bolt on the first, phase, first order phase transition to inflation, you get all sorts of exciting possibilities. And grand unification, you can sort of bolt, bolt that onto inflation as well. And uh, this could be one of the uh, first order transitions occur occurring during inflation. Um, the analysis of these effects at like the gravity wave production, black hole formation, is all based on very old um, ideas of instantons, bubble nucleation, and then the classical evolution of these bubbles. So much of the underlying theory is, is like 40 years old or so. Um, and I think some of us have, have believed that um, there's a need to update the theory, for example, to include quantum corrections to the instantons, and also to try and develop a real-time picture of what's happening when these bubbles nucleate, and also try to find some, some of quantum effects to do with the interactions between the different bubbles. So we believe, I and I'm preaching to the converted here mostly, I suspect, but we believe that there's a need to update um, the theory of uh, bubble nucleation uh, in, in the early universe. And this has uh, led us to look at the possibility of having bubbles uh, in the laboratory um, to try and uh, have an experimental um, approach to, to analyze some of these ideas and sort of develop the theory which would apply both to the laboratory setup and to the uh, early universe setup. If we're trying to analyze what's happening in the early universe, um, there are certain features that are desirable, I would say essential. Um, we'd like the system to be uh, locally at least homogeneous because um, the early universe was uh, roughly homogeneous. Uh, we're studying first order phase transitions, so we want to see a first order phase transition. We would like to mock up a relativistic field theory. We'd like to have a relativistic type of phase transition. Um, uh, a cold atom system, for example, is, 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 is going to have many non-relativistic features, but we really want to see a first order, uh, trend, uh, sorry, a relativistic system. And finally, um, if we're going to really test our models, we, we, we'd like as many parameters in the theory to be tunable as possible. Um, so we'd like to, to have all these features, and especially the tunable requirement here, leads us naturally to look at the possibility of using cold atom or Bose-Einstein condensate systems. Um, liquid helium, for example, um, has, ha has regimes where it has first order phase transitions, um, but it doesn't have the same tunability that uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate system would have. So I'm gonna describe some cold atom systems. Um, just a quick word on units. Everything I'm going to describe is in some natural set of units um, based on the density of the cold gas, the mass of the atoms, 
and there's always going to be some kind of quartic coupling in the system. From these, you can build an energy unit, um, which will typically be the uh, chemical potential in the system. You can build a length unit called a healing length, and you can build a time unit, which is a healing length to vary by the sound speed. Um, so uh, everything I'm going to be talking about will be in this natural set of units. Uh, just to mention one more thing, I'm going to talk about one and two dimensional systems. Uh, in these systems, uh, we require that the transverse, the, the extra loss be much less than the healing length. And then if a system, for example, is two dimensional, and uh, but its thickness is less than the healing length, it will behave like a true two dimensional system. Great so far. I'll go start with the vacuum decay in a two-state atomic system. Um, I think in many ways, uh, it, it was this system which uh, started off um, uh, the interest of, 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 of people in this consortium. Um, so I'm gonna describe the model, first of all, of the alkaloid hell. So in this system, there are two, um, the, the system just has, has one species of atom in it, but because there's a magnetic field applied, uh, the, the atomic states are split uh, by the Zeeman effect, and, and there are two close-lying uh, Zeeman levels, which I'll describe by a, an angular, uh, by an orbital, as a mutual angular momentum, m equals plus or minus a half. Um, this system, these, these two states are mixed by a radio frequency field. This radio frequency field um, is going to parameterize by two parameters and going to call one epsilon and another one lambda, which is the amplitude of a, a modulation. So the radio frequency field is itself, it's a constant plus an oscillator a bit. And the, the oscillations have frequency omega. And in this system, um, you can have collisions between the plus or minus a half states. But in this case, the collisions are tuned by a resonance such that there are collisions between the plus a half and plus a half states and the minus a half and the minus a half states, but there's no, collision, there's no collision between the plus a half and the minus a half states. Um, so that's a very special feature, in fact, which, which kind of makes the model work. So this system we can describe in terms of a Hamiltonian um, with a, a field that's got two components for the two uh, angular momentum states. And, um, we can write the Hamiltonian in terms of a potential. Now, in, in, in this business, um, and sp speaking most to uh, quantum field theorists, I think, today. Um, so in this business, uh, the potential is always going to be the field potential, and not to be confused with the trapping potential, which atomic physicists put into the uh, systems. So the field potential here as a quartic term. Well, yeah, there's a quartic term. In this case, I put the couplings to be equal. There's a, a quadratic term. Uh, by the way, is it possible to see my, I should be able to see my cursor here, hopefully. I'm gonna feedback here. Anyway, um, there's a quartic term, a quadratic term. We can, see, we can see the cursor. Excellent. It's a quartic term, there's a quadratic term, which is the, the chemical potential term. And then there's the mixing term, which, which uh, is caused by the radio frequency um, oscillations that are applied to the system. Um, this system is then averaged over some, um, it's averaged over this modulation with frequency omega. And, and it turns out to have some relativistic quantum field theory type behavior. And we can see this perhaps most easily by looking at the dispersion relations or fluctuations about the false vacuum in this system, so-called Bogubov modes. Um, the dispersion relation has a, a Klein-Gordon term, k squared plus m squared to the half, also has an extra bit, which is, which is a, a sort of atomic physics thing. And there's an effective mass in this system when you've done an averaging over these oscillations. Um, so as long as we make the wave number, k is the wave number here, as long as we make the wave number much smaller than two in our units, then the k squared plus four term can, just becomes two, and we get omega k squared plus m squared to the half. So as long as the wave number is small enough, that's we're working on large enough scales, uh, this system has a, has a relativistic dispersion relationship. And, uh, I, 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 and well, it's exactly what we desire for looking at relativistic phase transitions. 
you can isolate the body buff mode quite simply by uh, writing the two components of the spinner field as uh, e to the plus or minus i psi on two. In other words, taking this this variable psi, sorry phi, to be the diff to be the difference in phase of the of the m equals a half and m equals minus a half components. If you substitute this into the action, we get a, an action just for this one bog lubov mode, uh, which is just the usual klein gordon action. And uh, the potential you get when you do this has this lambda ginsburg form, that is, it's got two minima, uh, a local minima and a, a global minima. The height of the potential is determined by the parameter lambda, which remember was uh, the modulated RF field, and the epsilon uh, the, the, the difference in energy of the vacuum states is determined by the amplitude of the RF field, the radio frequency field. So we can tune the barrier height and we can tune the difference in height of the uh, two potentials of the two uh, minima. Uh, Tom and Ruth Gregory, uh, Tom Billam and Ruth Gregory and uh, Flora Michel, uh, and I looked at this model in, in a different context, but we did some simulations in 2D with just, just, just with this plane model. These are these are Tom simulations. It's actually running. <laughs> it takes a while before the bubbles start to appear, and hopefully you can see bubbles appear. And there are hundred, there are hundred, there are hundred different simulations here. I hope you'll see that the roughly uh, circular bubbles appear, and uh, blue is the uh, false vacuum and yellow is the true vacuum. The bubbles nucleate, and eventually we we fill the space. Uh, well, we have 100 universes here, but we fill each of these universes. Uh, three have been left behind for some reason at the end of this simulation. So that's, um, oops. Uh, sorry. Come on, just, 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 there we go. Um, so this, um, well, this is all well and good. Um, it's just that um, some members of a consortium uh, found that this system has a parametric resonance. Uh, which leads to a, a, an instability that rather spoils the uh, bubble nucleation picture. In these simulations, Tom chose the grid spacing uh, such that the, 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 the annoying resonance was cut off by the grid. So, so, so basically, um, we've managed to exclude the, uh, the instability, another instability, by just by choosing the grid carefully. Um, so there's some concern about whether this parametric resonance could affect the system or whether it can just be pushed somehow into the small scale physics, which the, um, the, the theory that we're using doesn't describe. And so that's still up for grabs. We're hoping that the resonance won't appear, I think, in the experiments. Um, they're being planned by Zorin. Uh, Zorin is actually trying to recreate this model in, in his laboratory as part of our efforts. Um, Newcastle, uh, our... Um, Part of our task was to was try to try an alternative systems just in case, just in case the two-state system didn't work. And we have um, come up with one. Um, so this one is a spin one system instead of a spin half system. So it's one of three states, m equals uh, plus one, zero, and minus one. And um, there are new features in this system. Uh, first of all, we make use of what's called the quadratic Zeeman effect. Um, more about that later. We still have the radio frequency meet, mixing. Um, again, we parameterize that by parameter epsilon. By the way, I should mention these omegas that keep appear, appearing. Atomic physicists like to measure energies as frequencies. Uh, in this case, the energy um, splitting of the levels due to the RF field is, um, is given by the, well, it's, it's the magnetic moment times the magnetic field, it's mu dot p. And when that's converted to a frequency, in this case, it's called a Rabi frequency. Uh, so you hear, you hear atomic physicists talking about Rabi frequencies all the time. So here's one. Um, now this system, the new feature we've added is, is Raman mixing. So we add uh, two lasers. So in, <laughs> the idea is that we would add two lasers, two laser beams, and they're tuned so that the atomic states can't quite be excited to the, the next higher level. So these, these lasers don't cause excitations of the system, so we don't push the system into a new state. Um, but instead, when you have two lasers like this, um, what it does is cause mixing between a, a plus one and a minus one 
state. Um, this kind of Raman mixing has been realized in experiments. Um, and this, this, is, this system, by the way, I think because you have, we have these two sloping lines here, uh, this system is called the, the, lambda, the lambda system. And I, I think capital lambda, I think maybe it's because these lines sort of make, make this look like a lambda, capital lambda. So what we've done is we've combined this lambda with the RF field mixing to can sort of complete the base of the triangle. Um, I don't think this has been done before, actually, combining Raman mixing with the RF mixing, but it, it all goes through very nicely, analytically. Um, so we've got RF field mixing, we put Raman mixing in, and um, in general, um, there are, okay, <laughs> if the magnetic field is not too, not too strong, the, quadra the quartic terms of the potential rotational is symmetric. It turns out there are two rotational symmetric quartic terms in general, and these will have some uh, uh, coefficients are written as g and g prime. So these are all the features in this model. So the potential I've written as a, 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 as a v naught. So the first term is the natural, the normal quartic term. The second term is another quartic term that's allowed if spin is bigger than a half, and that's parameterized by g prime. Uh, the third term is chemical potential. The fourth term is a quadratic Zeeman effect. And then underneath we have the mixing terms, which are added to the ones above. Um, <coughs> the first one is the radio, the, the RF, the, the radio frequency mixing, um, which mixes the plus one zero and the zero minus one states. And then we have the Raman mixing, which mixes the plus one and the minus one states. So we need, we need this fully mixed system in order to get the, the, the false vacuum decay. I'm going to describe in just a moment. So this is a new system. Um, we are we are sticking our necks out a bit here because, um, well, uh, Tom Tom is an expert in atomic theory, but we are um, suggesting something that's I think quite unlike anything that's been achieved before. Um, however, being theoreticians, we just uh, carry on regardless. Um, by the way, there's a very nice um, PhD thesis by a student uh, of um, a student in Rochester. Um, which describes this, this lambda system, which is mixing uh, using these using Raman spectroscopy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, now here's this, this. This is a bit of a busy slide. Apologies for that. Um, the ground state system of this, uh, we've just gone to, from spin half to spin one, but already the ground states are much more complicated. Um, so, uh, Start with the uh, yellow, with the white square here. Um, we can write the three components of our, of our uh, wave function in terms of modulus and amplitude. Remember, we scale the density out here. So the amplitudes have been labeled by zeta. And because the amplitudes, are, the, the density is scaled to one, we got zeta plus, we got the zeta squared sum to one, which means um, the zeta parameter lies on a sphere. But because of symmetries, it just lies on one quadrant of the sphere. Now, um, <coughs> uh, we, can, we can represent the sphere by a, a Molweda projection, and the, we can represent the quadri <laughs> a quadrant of the sphere by just one segment of the Molweda projection, which is shown in the picture on the left. So this shows um, the dependence of the potential on these parameters zeta, which parameterize the amplitude of the wave function. There are various ground states. For example, the antiferometric ground state is one where the plus one and minus one components point in opposite direction. So it's a bit like an antiferromagnet. The polar phase is the one where the, we only have the m equals zero component occupied. Um, but we're concentrating on what's called a broken axisymmetric phase, where all of the components are occupied. So this is like, if you like the most complicated phase, where there are, where, where there are, there's an occupancy number in each of the different angular momentum components of, of the wave function. It's only this phase that we find the false vacuum state. This state would normally be degenerate in terms of the angle, it would have a double degeneracy over the phase of the wave function. But by putting in the mixing terms, we break the degeneracy and produce a false vacuum state. So the second picture on the right 
shows the potential as a function of the phases, the phase angles, theta and phi, in the uh, wave function. And there is a local minimum um, at the bottom right left-hand corner, and the global minimum at the top left-hand corner. And we'll, we, so we can look at um, vacuum decay um, along the uh, left-hand edge, along the theta equals zero part of this picture. So the vacuum should decay um, from phi equals zero to phi equals pi. So this system has a false vacuum state and it has, uh, should show quantum tunneling and bubbles. Hi, uh, we got, uh, Jonathan's got a, a question. Thanks, Jonathan, what do you want? Yeah, I just, I wanna make sure I understand. So I should think of this top left plot as fixing the number densities. Yeah. And sort of the phases are fixed in there. And then I've, I've said, I found the state I care about. I'm basically just going to fix the densities and ask how things change at the phase. Yeah, that's right. If you look at the scales, okay. of the, if you look at the scale of the potentials, you'll see the scale on the, on the, on the right-hand picture is, is, is much more refined than the one on the left. So, so most of the difference in potential is, is, is from the amplitudes. But once you fix those, <coughs> you've just got this small change due to the phase. Does that help? Answer the question. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Yeah. No, I'd, nice I'd, I'd, I'd like to spend variables. time on this picture because it, it, is quite a, it is quite a busy picture. Uh, Andrew, what, what, what did you want to ask? It's, it's actually Hiranya. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, Hiranya. I, uh, maybe it's the same question Jonathan had, but the sound isn't great here. What is the color scale again? So pink um, is, is, is a lower potential and blue is higher potential. Okay, yeah. thank you. And there's a scale. There's, there's a scale um, on, on on attached to these pictures as as well. Um, the scale is in is in this, this natural energy unit, which is roughly um, well the chemical potential. It's it's G times rho, uh, where G is the coupling. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Yeah. No, it's it's really. Uh, I, I really um, encourage questions because it's it's a bit demoralizing just giving a talk on Zoom. <laughs> I don't get any feedback, at least with a, a live audience. I could I could be staring in the whites of people's eyes. <laughs> okay, so there's the uh, phase diagram, and it looks like we can have a, we have a false vacuum state at um, uh, a theta, uh, sorry, phi equals zero and a true at phi equals pi. I've deliberately chosen the variables here so it looks rather like it's been half system in that the, the bubbles will be in the, 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 the phi coordinate. Uh, it's physics. Well, um, first of all, there are, there are conditions on the parameters for the existence of this broken axisymmetric vacuum state. Um, and this relates omega q is the quadratic Zeeman effect and G primed and G are these quartic couplings. And you see that G primed has to be negative if G is positive. So G primed has to be negative. So that limits the, atomics, uh, the atomic systems we can use. The dispersion relation tells us whether this is relativistic or not. And um, in the case of the Spin-Hoff system, we had a, a K squared plus four. And so our condition for relativistic system was that K had to be less than two in our units. In this case, instead of k squared plus four, we have k squared plus twice the quadratic Zeeman effect, um, which means to get a relativistic system, we'd like a large quadratic Zeeman effect, which means because of the, because of the inequality on the quadratic Zeeman effect, we need the g prime over g to be as negative as possible. And this isn't so easy, to, in fact, to achieve. Um, so here are three um, atomic species. These are the only ones, uh, the, the only common alkali species, which are used, which have the property that this parameter G prime is negative. There are lithium-7, potassium-41, and rubidium-87. Uh, this the atomic physicists measure this quart quartic coupling in terms of what they call the S-wave scattering lengths. And to get a negative G prime, you need one of these S-wave scattering lengths to be bigger than the other one. In fact, the A0 bigger than the A2. And this is only the case for uh, these three elements. Um, there are some other considerations to do with the, the uh, total length of the momentum. So these, for any atomic physicists listening, these are all F equals one uh, systems. 
Um, so um, theoretically, we would we would like to we would like to use lithium seven because that's got that's that's the most relativistic, if you like. Um, also, it, it, we can sort of try and reduce the the effective mass of the scalar field, and maybe we can work with large lower lower values of the quadratic Zeeman effect. But then we find the modeling is more difficult. Uh, basically, if you have a low value of k, your bubbles are going to get very big. And in terms of your resolution on your grid, so you're going to have to have a, a bigger and bigger grid size. So basically, as you go from top to bottom of this table, the numerics get harder. On the other hand, um, I'm told that, that, that experimentalists are very fond of rubidium. And so they would rather be at the bottom of the table. We haven't managed to get our numerics to work for rubidium so far. But in principle, rubidium is a possible uh, example of this model, but we haven't, but it, it, it's a tough ask because of the, the very, um, well, because of the very uh, close values of these two S wave scattering lengths. Um, the other thing in the table is hyperfine splitting energy, which, which um, tells you what the, um, what the quadratic Zeeman effect is. That, that is that the, the it, it tells you how big the quadratic Zeeman effect will be for a given magnetic field. Silk, did you have a question? Yeah, just a quick one. Why is it rubidium 87? Is it because um, it's tunable interaction strengths? Or what, why are they favoring this one? Uh, it's, it's, it's the only one which um, we, we need this, the scattering length A, A1, A0 to be bigger than the scattering length A2. And, and the, there's only a limited number of elements that have this property. Uh, that is, but that we could find in our search of the literature. It's possible that all because there may be things we, we, we just haven't found in the literature. You said amongst the three of them, there is one favorite. That's how I understood it between lithium, kalium, and uh, rubidium. Lithium works very well theoretically and numerically. Um, experimentalists would rather use rubidium. Apparently, it's much easier to work with, and and, and it's, it's it's got the largest scattering length and so on. So it's that was it's my question. Easy. Why is it easier to work with? That was my question. It's just I think thing. the. I think one thing is um, the, the the smaller the scattering length, the bigger the trapping the, the stronger your trapping potential has to be, and the 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 lower your condensate temperature is going to be. So basically, rubidium uh, you don't have to get that cool. I, I believe this is the case. I, uh, whereas lithium, you're going to have to be very very cold and have a very very strong trap. Thank so I think you. that's thank you. And I'm again, I'm, 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 I'm way from my comfort zone here. Um, let's see, I think that's everything I wanted to say on that slide. There are some numbers just listed across the bottom that Tom worked out for a system, 1D system using, uh, using lithium. Um, if, if, we, if, if experimentalists tell, told us it had to be rubidium, we would just work harder on the numerics. But I, I, it might never be relativistic, though, which would be a great pity because we really want to study a relativistic system here. So we, uh, in the paper, we uh, give results from Kate's uh, numerics. So these are 1D simulations here. Um, as usual, well, okay. <laughs> we always plot the, um, the space uh, coordinate vertically and the time horizontally. Unlike Jonathan, people always plot the other way. Anyway, um, so uh, space is vertical here, time is horizontal, the false vacuum state is yellow, the true vacuum state is blue. The first two columns are lithium, the third column is potassium. Um, so we get nice bubbles with lithium uh, in this 1D system. Notice the nice clean edge that's moving at, well, it would be 45 degrees if you stretch it a bit. Nice clean uh, relativistic uh, motion at the uh, sound speed uh, for lithium. 41 potassium, um, we don't expect to be so relativistic. And there's a, there's a good example on the bottom right picture of a bubble which accelerates and starts to decelerate. What's happening here, we believe, is that the bubble, as a bubble wall gets thinner, um, it starts to explore the non-relativistic regime and, and starts to then uh, show non-relativistic behavior. And the non-relativistic bubble likes to decelerate and even turn around like this. So um, at least the beginning bit of the bubble is sort of relativistic. So you might get away with potassium. Um, but you might see these effects, these non-relativistic effects. Uh, by the way, I think those of us 
who've simulated bubbles have seen this kind of behavior before. Andrew? Yeah, can I just, I, I think I can see that they're periodic boundary conditions here, are they? And, and you're showing us the full box. Yeah. So right. is, it, is, it, is, is there any chance, there's any sort of self-interact between the bubble and itself that's contributing to what you're seeing? Or is, is, is it, do, do, do you see what I mean? Where, yeah, where yeah. It's, it's, it's quite possible, yeah. So it's quite possible, Andrew, that's an alternative explanation. It's, it's, it's just that um, of, we've done a lot of simulations with normal relativistic system, and we've seen this deceleration phenomenon before. I think uh, Jonathan's seen this, this before as well. It, no, we look at a non-relativistic system. You don't you don't get these nice forty-five degree lines. You tend to get this deceleration. You could be right, Andrew. It could it could well be in this case that that, that this is this is a different explanation. It's just that that bubble wall is is squeezing itself. That's true. okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so those are Kate's one D simulations, and she's fit the she's fit the decay rate. Um, let's see if I hurry up a bit, I think. Uh, let's see. So um, on the left is the um, bubble nucleation rate for lithium as a function of density. And on the right is the bubble nucleation rate uh, as a function of density. We have uh, compared these to the, um, the Coleman formula. Uh, a nice thing about these models is that you can scale at the density and this other parameter epsilon um, and, and, and then everything else is just pure numbers. Um, in principle, uh, uh, in principle, the formula at the bottom here, um, all these parameters, a is, 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 is a prefactor, uh, lambda, rho, chi, is, all of these pr parameters in principle are about, you could evaluate them exactly in principle if we were clever enough. Um, in practice, um, looking at the determinant to get the a factor is a real challenge could be done if we really had to. And the other thing is, from previous work, we found that we couldn't get good fits if we just use the parameter lambda that we're given. And we've been interpreted this as a vacuum polarization effect. And of course, that gets us onto an interesting topic. Um, there has been progress recently um, by, by our consortium on uh, vacuum polarization. And um, if you really want to fit using the, the sort of real parameters, then we would have to understand this. And, uh, and, and so uh, these people, uh, well, the people here have risen to the challenge to some extent. Um, although I think it's fair to say that the, 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 question, the, the whole issue of vacuum polarization is not a closed one yet, um, but certainly a lot of progress has been made in this recent work uh, listed below. At the moment, though, um, we're just fitting, we're treating uh, the prefactor A and the coupling lambda here as just free parameters. So we don't have to worry about the vacuum polarization. We, we fix them and then we do a fit. And the fit for lithium, I think, well, it's a two parameter fit. Uh, I think it's, well, okay, it's excellent. Say so myself, but I think it's excellent. Um, the fit for potassium is not so good, but then again, we are trying to pretend the system's relativistic when it's not. So maybe we don't expect such a good fit for that system. Um, sorry, Matthew, Matt, what, what is it? Hi, Ian. Um, I was just curious how far off the bare, um, the bare values for these parameters you have to go in order to produce an acceptable fit? I think we're talking 10 or 20%, not a great deal. Not not tiny, but um, but not so much that that that, that we wouldn't hope that it, that, that it was um, that there's possibly a renormalization effect. I okay, mean, th thanks. this is a yeah. it's rather a big issue. I, I mean, that this I'm talking about this as a lambda renormalization, but in fact, what it didn't well what's on the previous slide. Let's go back a couple of slides. Somewhere on this slide, there's there's a value for the mass. It's epsilon lambda squared minus lambda c squared. So this thing, uh, lambda minus lambda c here, that appears in the exponent, you can actually think of it as a mass. So you can think of this as a mass renormalization. So we're getting very close to the kind of subject that's being discussed in this recent paper. Um, um, but give me a chance to, to absorb that paper first. Uh, yeah, no, I was just curious, I, I, but that's, that's helpful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So... 
yeah so this vacuum vacuum renormalization polarization uh, vacuum polarization is an important so i call it vacuum polarization and I, I mean you can call it renormalization you can call it vacuum energy you can call it like um anyway so the promising that's promising uh fit but um okay not quite there yet 2d um so these are kate simulations in 2d this this is periodic boundary conditions same model um I have to wait for it to do something. Um, yeah, it will do something in a minute. The, the, things about thing about double nucleation, it's exponentially suppressed. You can wait a long time. There's a bubble appearing in this simulation. Um, there's, there's, there's things that are right here, right? We get a nice a circular bubble appearing. But things we don't understand is, is that once you get one bubble, you tend to get other bubbles appearing as well. And okay, there's a lot to understand here. Well, okay, Silky put a hand up first. I'm surprised. Uh, just uh, maybe it's just me, but um, the bubbles are not very nice. They are not very clean. I mean, there's a blob as well, which may be too, but in general, they don't seem as. I agree. Clean. Why? Yeah. Do you have an idea what's going on? No. Um, it's possible we're not very far in the perturbative regime. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite possible that, that we've just... So what we've basically done is, is, is try to adjust the parameters until we start to see bubbles. Um, and it's possible we've not gone far enough to get into the perturbative regime. If you go too far, sorry, into the non-perturbative regime. If you go too far into the non-perturbative regime, you're waiting forever. So it's, there's always, it's always gonna be difficult to, to see a, a very clean, you know, bubble nucleation scenario, um, unless you wait for a long, long time. But you're right. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would put it another way. I, I said, you know, there are possibilities here. The, 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 for example, the bubble wall looks very fuzzy. I um, suppose that carries forward to the uh, universe bubbles, electric phase transition bubbles that have a massive effect on things like baryogenesis. The way that baryogenesis is worked out at the moment is that you treat the, you treat the particle modes as quantum waves. But you treat the bubble wall as classical, classical entity. But what if the bubble wall has, has is fuzzy and has these perturbations on it? Um, I mean that could make a serious difference to things like baryogenesis. So it's possible this is, these are just features of the of the cold atom system. But you know one one might hope <laughs> that there's something deeper in this. Yeah. So the answer is we don't understand why these are not right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, Shall I, um, so, uh, and Andrew want to? Well, I, th I think we had more or less the same question. Can I ask a different follow up question? I mean, yes, there's a lot of uh, structure that you see, but the structure, there's a small scale structure inside the bubble as well. Um, yeah. How, I mean, so this is a slice through the simulation, is it? Yeah. Or, oh, sorry, it's too deep, right? Yeah. I think this is this is one place where the fact that we're good, not got an expanding universe could be making a difference because. There is a difference in energy between the true and the false vacuum state, and the energy has got to go somewhere. Uh, in the other universe, that's going to be still diluted by the expansion of the universe. So that so so this is possibly a shortcoming of of, of doing work in in a, in a flat space setting, that we may have to live with this. But if we can understand it, then at least we can account for it. Yeah. Any questions? Well, we we got, we 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 we've been making Kate busy. Uh, we got her to do something with a square trap as well. Um, oh, is this working? There oh, we go. Uh, ignore everything um, around. Uh, ignore everything in the picture frame. You get wild phase oscillations when the density is effectively zero. So the, the only bit of relevance is yellow bit in the middle. We were worried that the um, the nucleation will occur mostly on the boundary. Uh, and it does, I think, it's fair to say, but sometimes uh, we've cherry picked the simulations. We get bubbles nucleating inside like this one. And there's something, yeah, this is not a period, well, okay. <laughs> this is a periodic uh, simulation in the sense that there's another identical square beyond the edge and you could have some some um, some information passed from one square to the next through the 
through the barrier, through the trapping barrier. Hi, yeah, what's the question? Sorry, sorry to ask another question. Wait, how, how are you initializing this with the with with the trap there? With great difficulty. Um, <laughs> the thing is, once you put the trap, with this this is particularly difficult with the spin one case, because what we actually get is a phase transition to the boundary. So we have to um, carefully set this up. We we have to do a, a separate simulation, but Kate has to do a sim separate simulation to actually find the ground state which is rather non-trivial as well. So she evaluates, she, she, she does an evolution with dissipation, first of all. Uh, so it's like an, almost like annealing to the ground That's state. That's right. She has to do a, a one with dissipation, and then, and then she, one, one, once that's settled down, she has to start with a real-time evolution. Yeah. And, but that is much harder than the spin half case, because like I said, actually, there's, there's, a, there's a region near the, near the edge of the wall, wall where the... Uh, the phase actually goes away from broken axis symmetry. Um, but we don't have the, we thought we'd have a catastrophic nucleation of bubbles near the boundary, but we don't find that. Um, even though the bubble's quite, quite, the, the wall is quite thick, thin here. It's a tanch potential uh, here. And the, 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 the density is basically zero uh, in the picture frame edge here. Any questions? Thanks. I need to rush a bit. So we tried fitting these and comparing to the nucleation rate. And it's been a bit disappointing, to be honest. Um, the uh, nucleation rate versus density has the right trend. But, uh, but to be honest, I don't think we, we're not, this is not, these are not fits. These are just uh, data points. And I don't think we're gonna get a good exponential from the, uh, the first little part on the left. The plot on the right, um, the nucleation rate should increase with epsilon and it decreases. So we, uh, at this point, we actually, to be honest, we gave up <laughs> and we started to do the thermal simulations. We're not totally given up. We've, they, we've, we've parked this for a while, let's say. Um, so that's, that's where we are at the moment. We've not got good agreement with the, with the instant on rate for the 2G case. Disappointing, I'm afraid. That's where we're at the moment. So, um, so we've come up with this spin one system. Uh, it doesn't require fastback resonance. Doesn't have a parametric resonance. Uh, doesn't require. Doesn't have a parametric resonance. Um, to be honest, we've not talked to experimentalists. Well, we've had we've had referees to our papers, but um, I can't, you know, hand on heart say it's a realistic proposal. I, I really need some feedback from experimentalists. Uh, we've got a mixed picture of comparison with uh, instanton methods. We were worried whether the truncated Vigna approach we're using is, is correct. Um, uh, 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 how do we fix this? We don't know. Um, there is some renormalization of parameters. Of course, we could just say that we don't know the Burr values anyway, so why don't it just always fit to the experimental parameters? That's what we've done. And it's always a, you know, if, if, if we don't, if we don't have a full answer to the vacuum polarization effects, we can still live with that and just do the same fitting that we've done in these simulations here and just fit to the, to fit to the experimental parameters instead of using the Burr parameters. Um, and um, we're trying at the moment uh, okay, finite temperature simulations using the stochastic projected gross Pitiewski equation, uh, which is better motivated theoretically than truncated Wigner. <clears throat> and um, we're hoping that they'll do better fits to the instant on calculation. But that's, uh, that's all I have to say. So uh, thanks for listening.